Hello, Oscillator Sync here, and welcome to the first video in the series where we're going to be taking an in-depth look into the various different operator modes on the Korg Op6. So in this first video, we are going to introduce the idea of operator modes, talk a little bit about how they operate uh, and what we mean by algorithms. And then we're going to take a dive into the first of the operator modes, which is FM. So Korg described the Op6 as an altered FM synthesizer. And, and although I understand why they've lent in to the whole FM thing for the sake of familiarity, the success of the Volker FM, actually, I think leaning too much onto the FM side of things actually undersells the capabilities and flexibility of the synthesizer. Because what I think Korg have done with the synthesizer if they, is they've taken the idea of um, of FM and taken some of its sort of key philosophies, its key ideas, this idea of having multiple operators which flow into one another, changing the sound as they go, and ask the question, what if it's not FM? So before we talk about the operator modes, we need to talk a little bit about algorithms. Now the algorithm is what you see in this uh, diagram here on the left-hand side here. Uh, and what this diagram describes to us is the layout of the operators. So in this algorithm here, which is algorithm one, uh, at the bottom we have operator one and we have operator three. And these two operators at the bottom of the tower, if you like, those are the two operators that we actually hear, um, which in FM we refer to as the carriers. Although it's worth noting that for some of the operator modes, the carrier and uh, modulator uh, terminology doesn't actually work. We'll get to that in future videos though. So uh, at the bottom, we have our two operators that we hear, operator one and operator three, and the operators above them. So in the case of this first tower here, we have operator two, which is flowing into operator one, and that's going to alter the uh, sound that we hear from operator one. Uh, for operator three, we actually have a tower of operators. And that means that um, operator four is going to flow into operator three, altering the sound that we hear. But uh, before that, operator five is going to flow into operator four, which is going to modify the uh, characteristics of operator four, which is again going to have an impact on what we hear. And above that, operator six, again, flowing all the way down uh, and making a, an impact on our, uh, our th the sound that we hear at the end. I'm being intentionally vague because um, uh, what that actually means, what altering the sound actually means, is going to be determined by which operator modes we actually use. So if we go to our algorithm page, we're able to go through various different uh, algorithms. And as we scroll through the algorithms, we're changing the way that things are laid out. So here we have uh, two towers, so we're hearing two uh, uh, operators on our output and we, ha we have various different arrangements of how things are, are, are altering the sound of those uh, output carriers, output operators I should say. Um, again two towers there, here we have uh, three operators, one, three and five that we're hearing on our output. Um, these are those are a fairly simple arrangements of um, op uh, operator into one operator which we then hear, operator into an operator which we hear, uh, but we get to more complicated and complex uh, algorithms where we have multiple operators um, in parallel flowing into a single operator here. Um, big fan of, of algorithm 12 for, for various things where we have three different operators all flowing into that operator and modifying its sound. And uh, we have lots of different um, and increasingly complex in many cases layouts. And then towards the end here, we start getting um, slightly more simple layouts. Uh, algorithm 32, for example, is just simply listening to each of those um, operators, which in old style, DX7 style FM, that's kind of your organ patch layout. But on the OP6, because of what it can do, and because of the flexibility of the operators, that could be a really, really complex uh, six oscillator, if you like, uh, um, patch, depending on what uh, operator modes you're using. At the end here, we also have the user algorithm. Now I will speak about the user algorithm separately in another video because there's quite a lot to discuss there. Um, but um, suffice to say that using the user algorithm, you can do uh, incredibly complex layouts of 
um, operators and subvert the idea that there are operators that you hear versus operators that change the sound of the other operators. And actually you end up with a situation where you essentially have uh, operators which can be carriers and modulators at the same time. Um, really, really interesting stuff uh, that you can do with user algorithms. But we will get to that in another video. So when we're talking about changing an operator's operator mode, what we're talking about is altering how the uh, operators that sit above it. So if we take operator one as an example, as we change operator one's operator mode, we are deciding how operator two, which is flowing into it, is going to affect its uh, sound. And that's the way it works uh, all the way uh, through. And we can mix and match uh, operator modes uh, across all of our operators. So we can have a different operator mode in so, sort of part way up the tower here, for example, uh, to do very complex things potentially. So um, before we get into the FM um, mode, um, let's just quickly introduce uh, the various different operator modes um, from a really, really high level. And uh, they can kind of be grouped into uh, two different uh, sets. You have the uh, set which uh, maintains the idea of carrier and modulator uh, from FM, uh, but we're using uh, different types of modulation rather than straight frequency modulation. And then we have the modes where um, actually the, uh, the operator is going to more directly affect the sound of the incoming uh, operator that sits above it. So um, from a high level, we have FM, which is... FM uh, kind of as you would expect to see on um, on like a DX7 or the Volker FM. Uh, the next one is ring mod, uh, which is another type of modulation. So we can still think of this as carrier and modulator. Uh, ring modulation is uh, essentially amplitude modulation, a very different flavor of sound um, compared to uh, FM. Uh, this next mode is filter. This is the first mode where we can't really think about carriers and modulators because what this mode does from a very high level, there's some other stuff to, dis to discuss as well, is it takes um, the waveform, uh, the sound coming from the, uh, the, the operator above, it mixes it optionally with the, um, this operator, and then it filters. So we're actually, at a base level, we're filtering the sound coming from operator two. So that's a completely different idea to um, standard FM. Uh, the next mode is filter FM, uh, where we kind of have a similar situation where we've got a filter set up on operator one, but in this case, we hear operator one and operator two is going to modulate the filter cutoff. Um, so again, we've got a carrier and modulator relationship here, and again, a very different flavor to standard FM. The final um, proper mode is wave folder. This again is one of the modes where rather than there being a carrier and modulator relationship, instead uh, the um, lower uh, operator in the algorithm is going to directly affect the sound coming from the higher operator. Uh, in this case, it's going to apply wave folding. There's a lot to talk about for this mode as well. Uh, finally, uh, there are two uh, other modes. Um, one is bypass, and what bypass will do is it will um, do nothing other than directly pass through the sound coming from the operator above. So that's uh, easy enough. And finally, there is mute, which um, mutes the output um, at this stage of the algorithm altogether. So you could, for example, if you wanted to, you could stick a mute on operator five here and essentially cut off the the top part of this tower and just have two two-op voices, for example. Um, I don't think the mute is always that useful and certainly not that interesting because it doesn't make a sound. So one last thing before we get into the actual meat of talking about the FM, um, there is one control which is shared by all of the different um, operator modes. And that is um, here, uh, the wave control on this, just take down everything else, allows us to set um, a different waveform for the operator that we're currently listening to. So by default, that's a sign, which is classic in FM, but we can also have different resolutions of signs and then a whole host of different flavors. 
some additive stuff there, some uh, essentially pitch noise, and then also white noise. So um, what we should not overlook is that given that we have multiple different um, wave shapes and we do indeed have uh, a filter, the OP6, even if you don't do anything else, with the operator modes can be uh, a virtual analog synth, uh, a pretty fully featured one with quite a powerful modulation setup and with good effects. So it is quite possible to make very, very compelling patches on the OP6 without ever making use of any of the features of the uh, operator modes indeed. Um, if we think about the way that the algorithms are laid out, if we go over to um, algorithm 32, where we have the various different uh, uh, operators all sat along the bottom there, we essentially have um, like a uh, six, uh, <laughs> six oscillator virtual analog synth. Which we can start doing interesting stuff with, of course. So let's talk about our first operator mode, FM. So um, my uh, operator that we're listening to at the moment is operator one. We can see it down here in our algorithm. Um, that's the only one that's turned up. It has a single modulator, which is uh, operator number two, which is currently turned down. So it's not having any effect on operator one. So FM, what is it? Frequency modulation. Frequency modulation, if you do it um, slowly, is just vibrato, right? So as I turn up operator two, what that's going to do is it's going to add more and more pitch wobble to operator one. And obviously that's not doing anything interesting from a synthesis perspective and that's because the uh, frequency of operator 2 is below audio rate so it's somewhere below 20 hertz 20 hertz is kind of more or less uh, a good ballpark for the frequency uh, at which we stop hearing uh, a, m a movement and we start hearing a, a, a tone a pitch now if i increase the frequency of operator 2 and move it into audio rate. So it's still just about sort of discern a wobble there maybe. But now rather than hearing a wobble, as we apply more frequency modulation to operator one, instead what we get is a time roll change. And that is FM synthesis. It's basically doing a pitch wobble, but at audio rate, which introduces new additional harmonics to the sound. So in FM, there are basically three things which are going to affect the complexity or frequency content of uh, one of our carriers. The first um, we were just playing with, which is the uh, level of the modulator above it. Higher level, more complex sound. The next thing that's going to affect the complexity of the sound of our, our operator is the complexity of the modulator that's going into it. So for this, I'm going to move over to op three for a second and I'm going to bring up OP4 and this is basically sounding the same way as it was before because at the moment OP4 is just a simple sine wave. However, in our algorithm here, OP4 has a modulator sat above it, uh, OP5, and if we up the level of OP5, that's going to, in the same way that OP4 changes the complexity of OP3, OP5 will change the complexity of OP4, which will then change the complexity of OP3, which is what we're hearing. 
the relationship between these two. It can lead to a whole range of timbres. And of course, we could also change the complexity of OP5 by introducing modulation from OP6. And we can get some very, very harsh digital tones this way. Now that's the way you would have affected the complexity of the modulator on say uh, DX7 where everything uh, was a sine wave. But of course on the OP6 we don't have to stick with um, every waveform being a sine wave. So uh, another way of changing the complexity of our modulator is simply to change its wave shape. So if we go up to OP2 here and we can change its wave shape. So change it to a triangle. Get a different range of timbres there. Change it to a saw. Again, immediately a much richer sound without having to do anything to operators above there. These additive um, modes are really interested for this kind of thing. Because they tend to really accentuate particular resonances in the sound. And of course we could also frequency modulate with noise going to create a bit crushy kind of lo-fi vibes into our sound. Maybe more interesting to do as a further upstream. It's maybe up five. Almost adding like a digital vinyl dust to the sound. So the third way that we can influence the complexity of our operators is by looking at the frequency relationship between the carrier and its modulators. So we've come back over to just operator one here. And if we go into its pitch page, um, we can see two things of note. The first is that the frequency mode is set to ratio and what that means uh, on the OP6 and on the DX7 as well is that when we play uh, the keyboard, this uh, operator is going to follow the keyboard. It's going to give us keyboard tracking essentially. Alternatively, if we set this to fixed, it's just going to ring out at whatever frequency we have set here. We will come back round to fixed um, in a little bit, but let's stick with the ratio for the moment. Now, as we bring up operator, operator two, we can hear that, it, as we know, it's going to change the sound of operator one. Now, if we move over to operator two and look at its pitch settings, we'll see that it is exactly the same as operator one. Uh, it's set to ratio, so it's going to follow the keyboard, uh, and its um, ratio is one. So. Both of these operators have ratio of one. Um, let's just turn operator two down for a second. Um, all the ratio basically means is that we're going to multiply the frequency, but still have it work across the keyboard. So one, if we go to two, that's going to bring it up an octave because we double the frequency. If you go to four, that's going to double uh, it again and move it up an octave, we go to eight. And we have another octave there. In between there, we have the frequencies in the um, harmonic series, essentially. Well, not essentially, that's exactly what we have. So that's our harmonic series there. And we can go down as well into subharmonics as well. So um, at the moment, operator two is set to exactly the same 
so what we have here essentially is a one-to-one -one relationship between the frequencies. Whenever I press a key, uh, operator one has a particular frequency and operator two, our modulator, is going to modulate operator one by the same frequency because the ratio is the same. So one to one is a, a very simple, it's the simplest ratio that you can have between uh, two frequencies. And it is uh, a simple relationship. They're both whole numbers and it is close. It's as close as it can be. It's the same number. And generally speaking, uh, if you have something that is a simple relationship and also close by, what you get is uh, an integrated sound, which is tonal. So by tonal, I mean it sounds in tune, it sounds easy and simple for us to comprehend. By integrated, what I mean is, as I bring up the level of operator two, it very much sounds like what it's doing directly is changing the timbre of operator one, the carrier. We're not really aware of what operator two might sound like. It kind of sounds like really, as we turn it down, we're kind of just shutting off a filter almost. Filter in reverse kind of thing. Now, if we change the, the uh, ratio, uh, the relationship between these two uh, operators, something that's still pretty simple um, and still pretty close. So an obvious one would be to change um, uh, operator two's ratio to two. So now uh, operator two is always going to be double the frequency of operator one. We still get a nice tonal integrated sound, but it's different. In fact, uh, as a sort of uh, a cheat sheet for look of our analyzer, when we have a one-to-one, -one, we kind of get like a soft sawtooth when it's low, and then more complex stuff up at the top there. When we have a one-to-two relationship, kind of get this hollowed out sound, almost like a square wave. We can kind of see a sort of pseudo square wave there. And we get that sort of classic hollow square wave sound and it gets more complex and folded as we turn it up. Uh, if we um, keep the relationship simple between them, maybe go to half, Again, one of my favourite relationships, a, um, a uh, two to one relationship, if you like, where operator two is going to be going at half the speed of operator one. I don't know what wave shape that's representing, but uh, do always like that relationship doesn't seem to get out of control quite as much as the other ones so close simple relationships we have a tonal and integrated sound now if i um, take operator two and boost it up to say 10 so we have a one to ten relationship now when i turn up this Operator now, the vibe that we get is quite different because while it's still fairly tonal, unless we push it hard and suck in weird side bands, it's not as integrated. It almost sounds like we're introducing a sound on top of the sound that we already have. You can still kind of hear that original sine wave with a ringing over the top of it. So when you have a relationship which is simple, so still nice integer numbers, but um, distant, then generally speaking, what you'll get is a, a tonal but less integrated sound. <laughs> 
That doesn't mean that it's not useful. This sort of glassy resonance over the top is kind of a hallmark of digital synths, um, uh, FM synths in particular. Um, but it's quite a different flavour to when we were sort of noticeably changing the original sound with our closer ratios. So um, if we sit with our ratios just for a little bit longer, but now think about creating relationships which are a little bit more complex. So if we maybe go to like 1.25, so we have a 1 to 1.25 relationship. Close, so it's still pretty integrated sounding. But now it's slightly less tonal. 1 to 1.25 1, 1 is not a dreadful uh, relationship in terms of complexity, but we can immediately hear that the harmonics that are introduced here are not as straightforward, still pretty consonant, but there are definitely some sidebands there which are a little bit more interesting. You know, similarly, something like one to one point six six. That's a much more complicated relationship, and we're getting more of these bell-like atonal sounds. Still sounding pretty um, integrated because it's still a close relationship. we can choose something that's totally off the <laughs> something that's very complex so a 1 to uh, 0.94 ratio is a complex ratio to comprehend and as a result we get harmonics which are more complex and difficult for our ears to decode but still pretty integrated because it's still pretty close. Yikes. Now, of course, if we go complex and distant, then we start to get stuff that's less tonal and also less integrated. But conversely, where you have these more complex relationships, having them distant does make it slightly easier to stomach them in terms of the uh, dissonances um, because you have uh, fewer clashes because of the way the harmonic series is laid out. That's a very complex relationship. Not well integrated, but it's kind of not quite as dissonant as it was when it was much closer. <sighs> Yikes. So with all of those examples so far, we've had both operators in ratio mode, which means that um, the friction relationship is going to remain consistent as we move across the keyboard. So we've, even when we had sort of quite complex sounds the uh, and atonal sounds, they were playing consistently across the keyboard and we were just sort of getting the same sound at different pitches, more or less. Um, so what about the fixed mode? Well, the fixed mode is really, really uh, interesting. And I think it, what it does really well is it introduces resonances into a sound. It's very powerful when you use it quite sparingly, or you can use it more aggressively, but... So, we can quite clearly hear the original pitch of what I'm playing there, but with this fixed ratio mixed in there, we kind of get these bell-like ringing, clanging, atonal overtones. When it's set low, if we set it higher, the sort of the original 
sound is going to be somewhat lost. The original um, uh, uh, pitch, I should say, is going to be somewhat lost. Still interesting, especially when we mix in with something where, which is easy to hear. And changing the um, uh, frequency of the fixed uh, operator is going to uh, obviously give us different sorts of resonances. It's interesting to note that um, you can tune this somewhat if you're going to use this to introduce these resonances to the key of what you're playing in. So because this is currently set to 440, my A's are going to sound easy to understand. My E's, pretty easy as well, because uh, a fifth above is a fairly straightforward relationship. When we get into thirds, it's going to get a bit more complex. So this, for example, at the moment with 440 is not set up for playing in, in C. If you want to root things at C, but we could adjust it so that it is. My fifths and my octaves, pretty easy to understand. But that's quite a nice way just to add a resonance into our sound when you use sparingly. And of course, you don't have to do that directly into your operator, you could have that modulator modulator. So if we now move over to operator five here and set it back to a sine wave, set it to fixed. So now it's not my um, carrier that's being modulated by a fixed amount, it's the modulator that's going into my carrier and that gives a different vibe. It's so easy to make e-piano sounds on with, with FM. A great way to add grit, to add a fixed resonance to a modulator. Modulator, modulator with a fixed amount. Now, when we're looking at our fixed ratio uh, operators, there's um, uh, no reason why they actually have to operate at audio range. We can actually use them as a way to introduce pitch wobble. Now, that would be probably kind of boring um, to do a lot on a DX7 where you only had sine waves, but of course on the OP6, we have lots of different waveforms. So um, let's move across to a different algorithm. Let's go across to our sort of three voice so carrier, 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 modulator, modulator, modulator. And then we could bring up that first uh, operator there and we can switch it over to say like a sawtooth instead. And then we could bring up our uh, modulator here, but rather than have it going at a ratio and fast, we can uh, switch that back to fixed and move our um, frequency right the way down. And now we can hear that it's just sort of happily wobbling away. Which then immediately get rid of that introduces a lovely richness to our sound and the reason this creates this lovely richness 
is that all of these um uh all of the voices are, are going to be slightly out of tune with each other and the reason for that is that if we come into the miscellaneous uh, settings here uh and up to prog uh misc the phase for all of our operators is set to sync which means they restart whenever i play a note and no matter how carefully i try i'm not ever going to play all those notes at exactly the same time so everything's slightly out of phase and washy and lovely and we could um actually we could take that and copy it across and then we can copy our modulators across as well give our carriers a little bit of detune rich sound just by treating this as a, as a virtual analog and using our um, modulators to introduce oscillator drift essentially. drift. No uh, FM synthesis going on there at all, just treating it as a virtual analog. So let's take a little look at the different algorithms and what they're kind of good for. And generally speaking, you can group your algorithms or the parts of your algorithms into two different things. You have your towers like this, and you have um, your parallel inputs, so where you have multiple modulators feeding into a single carrier. So the way I usually approach uh, these two different ideas is that if I want to have something which is um, evolving um, in terms of its uh, frequency content, uh, then a tower is really good for that. Um, whereas your parallel inputs are good for mixing together different qualities of sounds so if we took um, the tower here that sits above operator three we could um, and we'll just leave all of these at um, one to one ratios just for the moment um, so we could have uh, operator four fade in slowly back out perhaps we would have operator 5 um, start high and then fate basically something very low but then maybe we would add um, some LFO to operator 5 Maybe something slower than that. Maybe a saw instead. Maybe have operator six um, fade in, uh, fade in very slowly, perhaps. <laughs> 
change the uh, key sync there to voice. And then of course we could filter that down and give it a bunch of effects. We have a lot of power to um, change the timbre of the, the sound over time with our tower algorithms. Uh, conversely, something like um, my favorite 12, where we have multiple things that can feed into uh, one carrier here, we can kind of treat each of these modulators as doing a different job. So um, we can have one, which is a simple relationship. So um, come across to operator four, we can have a simple relationship, maybe a half there. And then we could have the next operator along as something which is um, a much more complicated relationship. mix it in as much. So we've mixed together two different qualities. One is that quality and the next one is that one and they're still going to interact with each other. And we can balance them. And then maybe operator six we could do a fixed one to get kind of a bell-like resonance in there. different qualities that still interact with each other. We can get some interesting sounds based on how they interact. So um, we've come all this way without having to talk about, back on the mode screen, the fact that without having to do any FM at all, without having to raise the level of any of our modulators, the FM mode has an incredible amount of power to shape the timbre of the sound. And that's because we, uh, as well as obviously being able to change the wave shape, we also have this feedback control. So this is per operator feedback and also the width control. So I'll start with the feedback control. What this does is it essentially feeds this operator back into itself as if it was its own um, uh, modulator. And this can introduce a lot of really useful new harmonics. Indeed, if we're dealing with a sine wave as our basis, as we turn up the feedback, what we actually get to at about sort of 57% is a essentially a sawtooth wave with a bit of curviness on it, which is a really good basis for applying filters. Or indeed, 
uh, via the V patch, we could also, um, if we apply uh, EG1 and apply it to OP1 feedback. Drop the feedback a bit. So we're just modulating the feedback with a uh, uh, an envelope. This one, in fact, and it kind of sounds like a really convincing filter across. Sawtooth wave. Now, of course, changing our input waveform is going to give us different vibes there. More harmonically rich sounds might not generate as useful. That's really interesting. Um, I'm not doing anything with the actual FM here, just all with feedback. No filtering. Just all doing it with feedback. Crazy. Um, so to turn that uh, feedback down, the other control we have is width. And what width does, and we can see it easily when we look at our um, oscilloscope here, is it squeezes our waveform and sticks a bunch of DC there, which, to put it another way, it's kind of like PWM, but for everything. So obviously this is going to sound good if we move over to our square. Maybe go into our v-patch here. And... Uh, oh, get rid of that. Um, LFO1 can go to operator 1 width. Slow it down. But it doesn't have to be on square waves, we can do it on anything now. And pulse width on the triangle wave, for example. Sounds pretty good. Just like sine wave sounds good. And of course now we can introduce FM in there as well. 
also sounds good being modulated by an envelope as well and of course we can combine it with modulating our feedback So as you can see, the FM mode on the OP6 is obviously a very fully featured um, FM operator, but even if we don't touch anything in terms of pushing a modulator into it, it has an incredible amount of control over the, the sound, uh, and it can provide the basis for all sorts of sort of pseudo um, of virtual analog type sounds, because of course we do have the digital filter with multiple different modes, full control over its modulation on top of it. So we can do some really, really interesting things there. You could as well, potentially, um, and we'll get to this in a future video, have a filter per FM voice that's working independently to the master filter. But we will get to that when we talk about the filter um, operator mode. Anyway, I hope that was useful and interesting. If you did enjoy the video, then please do give it a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the channel because there's going to be a bunch of Op6 stuff coming up very, very soon. Other than that, until next time, take care. Bye-bye.